I think the area of research, I have seen it picking up in recent years, and I think the interest will remain, and it's going to be predominant in the future, because that's a, a, like a, it's believed the resource from underwater will last the whole uh, community of the like, international the globe for long time, way longer than what the amount of resources can support from the Earth, like from the uh, terrestrial part. Anyways, uh, so the topology of the underwater, uh, underwater networks typically say we have the underwater part, which is the hardest part. So the nodes are often deployed on the seabed or the sea floor, and uh, we may consider some uh, like a heterogeneous network. So the, some nodes equipped with more power capacity, bandwidth, like uh, the battery supply, and so on. So and uh, uh, they are communicating like uh, the nodes can form cluster, and uh, the information can be collected by the cluster head, and then using the vertical channel communicate with the service station, like it can be a service buoy, service like a boat, and all like the, um, uh, and then basically the, often the work, like we are, the assumption we make here is as soon as you get out of the water, like information above the water become much easier because you can use a satellite link, you can use a WiMAX, I think the ocean uh, marine, uh, marine uh, community still use WiMAX for communication, or like it's near shore, like use the cellular uh, services, like basically to collect, to send information to the onshore stations. So, and the, there are also some work in the past assume like the sensors of the underwater sensors are deployed at different depths of the underwater environment. But I like we uh, we've been always challenging the idea because uh, uh, fasting like basically attaching any state like any sensor nodes underwater like at different levels that's very challenging in from the engineering perspective so all the work we we've been doing is like assume that either the nodes will be near the surface or just on the surface or they can be deployed underwater like on the seabed or the seafloor and the recent years like i think uh like a, uh, since my last grant answer grant proposal that's like a CF, uh, nsf proposal in us like the uh, I see like a witness a big interest for the uh, underwater autonomous vehicles, like AUVs. It can be like the uh, glider or like a ROV, like a remote operated vehicles, basically for the ocean exploration. And especially they are widely used in the oil and gas industry, like in, in Canada and also worldwide. So uh, like the, basically these AUVs underwater, like they add the mobile component from networking perspective to the network and they can move in the area for data collection and also for like i've been like in recent years i've been doing a lot of work on the localization and tracking for the underwater objects like i say there can be the objects the nodes on the seabed using these auvs or using the auvs for the surface ships like they say the because the uh, uh, illegal fishery like uh, was one of the major problem in Canada, like in my province, like that's a, like a, so the DFO, like a Department of Fishery and uh, 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 they have a big demand and the Coast Guard also have a big demand of uh, monitoring the traffic near the economic zone of the country. So to see the, basically the surface situation, the boat and the ships, fishing boat and in the area. So basically like the, using the, this kind of network will be of great interest to the DFO and also the uh, like the uh, fish the fishery industry and also the oil industry. So like that's actually like uh, raised a good interest and also have a lot of demand in the research into this area. So the AUVs increased the mobile component. So basically, we have a it enables a lot of things. And actually, like uh, we talk about like uh, I think a couple of years ago we talk about the industry uh, like. Uh, uh, IoT, the Internet of Things, and the recent years we talk up more on the inter, uh, Internet of Underwater Things, and the, without these AUVs, ROVs, gliders, basically like we cannot really like we cannot talk about, talk about much on the networking side of the of the underwater situation like a scenario, but like a recent years like a, these the development in the AUVs do change the picture and made. The IOUT, the Internet of Underwater Things, become feasible. Okay, so 
um, you know, the bandwidth is the most significant change for underwater. And so I talked about like the terrestrial network, we're talking about megabit per second, gigabit per second, even tens gigabit per second. Whereas underwater, so after so many years, we are still at a very low end, like a several K, KBPS, even like a bit per second, 100 bit per second rate. So basically like we have the range we're talking about, like we can say that we can get 1K, 2K, or up to 5K, say within 1,000 meters, 2,000 meters. And beyond that, basically we lose the connect, like we, we are not able to um, achieve like a efficient or effective communications. And so that's the biggest change because without the communication backbone, like without the, like the highway, basically you cannot talk about networking, you cannot talk much about the internet or underwater things. So basically like the, uh, the work um, comes from like the two sides. On one side, the effort is to enhance the bandwidth provisioning like uh, in, for the underwater networks. And uh, also the AUVs did help a lot in the underwater network working scenario. And so, um, um, so basically like this, this is the work we are talking about, like uh, lots of challenges because the underwater, uh, after so many years, the acoustic remains as the main method for long haul communications. If you want to reach out several hundred meters, several kilometers, like uh, one or two kilometers, and you have like, you got to uh, use acoustic, um, like all long wave communication, whereas because uh, like uh, the micro uh, like uh, the, the magnetic uh, electromagnetic signal won't propagate; it will be absorbed very quickly, uh, like uh, within short distance. And the people attempt to use some other method, for example, the uh, magnetic induction method for communication. But once again, only higher bandwidth, large bandwidth, you can achieve, but very limited distance and uh, like basically within tens of meters, like most close to a hundred meters and beyond that, it's become difficult. And uh, additional, uh, some other work use optical. So basically use uh, uh, optical communication, but only certain type of light travels well in underwater, for example, like the, basically it's a blue or green laser, they travel a fair distance uh, others won't be that helpful, but again, the uh, optical communication, basically you need a very, uh, the receiver and the transmitter need to be aligned properly. And also the light will scatter in the water. So it won't, it will just have a dispersion and it won't focus, stay focused. So the hard to uh, be aligned between the receiver, you have to have achieved perfect aligning between the receiver and the transmitter. And also, like the 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 underwater, it's not like it's pure. It's not a clean environment because there's particles, there's a marine habitats, like the fish, like in the water, and also like near the bottom of the ocean, like the sea floor. It can be muddy and also have the plants, seaweeds, and all these. Basically, it will block the signal. So basically, like the optical communication, marine optical communication, only valid, only works short distance near, within the very near range, otherwise over long distance, it won't help. So basically like after explaining to all these underwater acoustic, that's a, still the those are only viable way for long haul communication for the underwater environment. Anyway, so we move on. And uh, so these are the topologies. Um, and uh, so I will mention like the Cephomatics project, which I did uh, starting from 2006. It's a three four three point four million dollar Canadian dollar project which we had with the Atlantic uh, uh, Atlantic region opportunity funds, and so that's when I started to work on underwater communication and networking. And uh, basically, the project had three uh, streams, like the one is on the sensing, so basically the sensor design for underwater different uh, underwater applications and also power generation. So that's a very unique aspect of the project. So many of the old projects like use a battery, but without considering the energy, like the energy harvesting, energy gener power generation. But we are talking about like the deployment in the environment for a long time, for over a year, like up to three years. So basically like even though the nodes are powered by batteries, but 
generating the power, like all the like uh, the energy, are still that's one of the main thing uh, we considered at the project. And also networking, how to effectively communicating, sending the sensing data out, and also uh, reach the coordination on the different nodes in the network. So basically, these are the three major tasks, and also include the system integration. So we have a working prototype. Actually, we deployed five nodes in the Newfoundland region, and uh, these are nodes are used by ExxonMobil and for the, and all those all companies. And so that's uh, um, like I will show a video at the end, basically how these like basically the, these are the pictures of the nodes. So it has a turbine for the energy harvesting and have the structure of the like uh, the uh, and the weight deployed to sink like to. Uh, sink the nodes to the bottom of the ocean and also the floats to retrieve. So basically we can use a re, like an acoustic release mechanism. Those nodes can be retrieved and flow back to the surface. So uh, after certain years. So that's something like I will show a video on the nodes and the other, how it's deployed and uh, through our sea trials. So the work here, uh, the, that work is mainly for the sea floor monitoring and instrumentation and mainly like uh, what's generated by the interest from the oil companies like uh, uh, Chevron, ExxonMobil, like for the ocean uh, underwater like uh, oil industry. So mainly like for the oil exploration. So basically they want, um, they are like a, for finding the wells, like the reservoir, like they normally like they do the, like they use the dynamite to generate the waves. And so then they analyze the data, like a, uh, the, the proper, like how the signal they explodes with information propagated in the air to determine the location. So basically the nodes like we designed have sensors to collect those information and send to those oil companies for uh, basically assessment of the region to decide which location they, like they do the, they, they do the drill, like basically to uh, find the oil. Because basically, one dry well, like a dry uh, uh, trial, basically cost them millions of dollars. So basically, like they, any efficiency, like uh, how to improve the uh, location, location information, that's a big achievement for like uh, for the oil company. Um, okay, so that's when I started. So basically, here uh, we compare the different method for our like uh, underwater communication. As I mentioned, like the Electromagnetic signal won't propagate well, and optical signal, they both can achieve high bandwidth. So normally in the megabit, gigabit per second range, whereas, but the distance is in the meters range. So basically after all these years, acoustic signal remains as the only choice for long haul communication for underwater. But we uh, basically, the restriction here is the bandwidth is very, very limited and often we talk about in the kilobit per second, in low kilobit per second range for the data rate for communication. Okay, so uh, the challenges is uh, like the, uh, not only the, uh, the the low bandwidth. Hello, uh, any questions there? No, no. Okay. okay, yeah, uh, sorry, for, uh, yeah, I heard some uh, conversation there, yeah. Okay, so and also the anything underwater deployed underwater, the cost is dramatic. Okay, it's not cheap. So uh, say like these acoustic modems, and we for the, our project we use the, the uh, DSP like we have DSP modem like a DSP com modem uh, from Aquacom, that's an Australian company, and also we use the micro modem from Woods Hole Institute, and uh, also we have the Sonodyne like a uh, Sonodyne a like blue com modem, and uh, basically like a the price here, like uh, the micro modem, seem to be the lowest, eight thousand range, but that does not include the DSP. So if you include the DSP uh, modules, the price went up dramatically. So basically, like uh, what we used for the project, looking at twenty five thousand dollar each US dollar each for the modem. So any nodes equipped with uh, two modems, one for horizontal communication, one for the uh, or, uh, vertical communication plus the energy harvesting and also the uh, the structure to maintain the uh, basically anti-corrosive structure to uh, for the equipment for the nodes. The overall cost for each node we're looking at 
almost a hundred thousand dollar each device, each node we are deploying. So basically, like a, with three point four million dollar project, uh, we it, we cannot afford to have too many nodes. So altogether for the project, we made five nodes, like basically prototyping nodes for the for the whole project out of almost like a four million dollar project here. So and also the ocean is so huge. Like I think. Uh, um, Everybody here, like I have seen the ocean, and uh, it's beautiful. But when you come to the seaside, it, you just exclaim, like uh, it's so big. No matter how many nodes you throw into the ocean, still that's not enough to cover a large area. So basically, uh, that's a restrictions we are dealing with. Like for the, uh, it's different from terrestrial communication. It's much much different. Cost is high, bandwidth is limited. So. And also, like a, the, like a, these are the material cost or the equipment cost. Even go for the sea trial, and uh, like a memorial is lucky to have the like we are on the coastal side, and we like the university have the boat, have the ships going for any deployment. So basically, it didn't cost us that much, but other places to do any trial that's uh, very expensive uh, to work on this kind of uh, project. Anyway, so basically here, like we use the different modems and we, as a work here, I presented the data, like basically the parameters I use is taken from the practical modems, like for example, the um, um, micro modem from Woods Hole, and also the Evologix modem, like basically we pick that modem, the parameter from that modem, mainly uh, they are supporting the different power level controls. So basically like they can reach different ranges and with different data rates, with different power levels. So that's a reason, like a, basically the parameters of these two modems are used in my work uh, that presented here. All right, so because of all these challenges, so often, like the underwater network are not like the terrestrial network. So like it's randomly deployed, deployed densely deployed. So in like on the other side, like often underwater network, what you are going to see, these are very, like every location you deployed are purposely or carefully chosen. And we don't consider a random deployed topology. It's kind of, a, we consider a purposely, a nicely designed grid topology here. And uh, it's sparse. It's not like, a, we try to put the nodes for as far away to provide better coverage because the cost is so high. You cannot afford to have too many nodes like in a small region. So basically, like a, these are the things that like often we see the some published like a, a paper submitted for review. Say also it's it's densely deployed and uh, it's uh, like a randomly deployed and uh, like basically like a, when you really work on these uh, like a real project that deployed in the region and you know like you cannot that's not something you can consider you can afford. So basically here, like we consider a kind of regular topology, a sparsely deployment, and we use the alpha to basically to describe within the transmitting range, how many nodes you can have. And the, the ideal situation is to put nodes as far from each other as possible so that you can have a better coverage. Because otherwise, uh, like a small region, you have too many nodes, you cannot use it, the cost will be just too high. And also the energy limitation, it's, battery operated, and uh, even though with energy harvesting, but still the amount of energy you can generate will be low. Like, so with our work, we consider using the tides, underwater like the tides as a energy harvesting. So basically like, that's something um, quite unique at the time when I mean, the project is done. And also the underwater, like the strong multi-pass and the long propagation delay. So we're not talking about millisecond, like a, uh, a microsecond or millisecond delay. So the, the, the coherence time, coherent bandwidth are quite different from the terrestrial. Multipass is strong, and the, the pressure of the water may cause the signal, acoustic signal, to bend. It's not going to propagate straight. It will be bent. So it will, the channel environment are different. So the motivation of this work is uh, like we have seen much work on the effort is on improving, uh, basically on the physical layer side, like uh, improving, uh, improving the Acoustic signal reception includes uh, network throughput. Very little work on the reducing, balancing the energy consumption of the nodes in the network. So basically, the like uh, that generated our interest here is to design, to uh, study the energy efficiency aspect of the two-dimensional underwater sensor network, 
in the long-term marine monitoring application. So we're not talking about just the short term, we're talking about nodes will stay in the area for a year or prefer even preferably for multiple years. Okay, so first we look at the channel. Okay, you cannot uh, do, go further without the, like a much better understanding of the channel. So for underwater acoustic channel, temporal, spatial variability, okay, it keeps changing. It's kind of a time-varying channel condition and the large propagation delay, often in the sec, like a minute, uh, in the uh, millisecond or in the, in, the, in the second range. It's not in the millisecond or microsecond uh, we, are talk, we are often see in the terrestrial network. Bandwidth, very limited. So often we are talking about like a kilobit per second or even like in the, in the, if already like in the tens of kilobit per second, that's a high bandwidth. That's a broad, like a very high broadband communication for underwater. But even say few hundred bit per second, I won't be surprised to see that. And the severe might pass. So, like the uh, reflection and the refraction from the seafloor and the ocean surface generate like a lot of refract, uh, and also scattering in the uh, in the ocean that like, generate multi pass propagation of the acoustic signals. And also, under like a basic acoustic signal, it's not electromagnetic wave; it's kind of mechanical wave. So, the basically the pressure field push the signal and then it converted to the different like the, the uh, signals uh, by the acoustic receivers the hydrophones. So basically like it's kind of a, it's fundamentally different from the uh, in-air uh, radio communications. So basically the two models often used to study the channel one called the theoretical model and it's, uh, another one is called normal mode, uh, normal mode model. So basically the principles is uh, the ray theory model, uh, model uses a sound rays diagram. So basically by tracing the rays to generate the model. Whereas the normal mode model uses the eigenfunction of a normal mode to describe the channels. And the, the ray theory model often uh, suitable for the high frequency near field, whereas the other one is for the low frequency and the far field uh, channels. And the, there are three approaches of the transmission loss calculation. So basically to calculate the propagation loss or the uh, uh, signal propagation prop aspect based on the ray theoretical model. So one is a coherent, Transmission, whereas uh, like a coherent, basically the two aspects, the intensity and the phase, are both considered involved in the eigen rays. And the incoherent, basically the phase are ignored and uh, only consider the intensity or the like, magnitude. And uh, the semi coherent, basically it's a kind of an insensitive to the environment, but it smooths out and uh, smooths out other uh, characteristics that cannot be properly predicted. So there are three ways of modeling, and uh, but the the complexity of doing this kind of calculation are quite different. The coherent is more precise, but the amount of computational complexity is huge. So, and uh, in an environment which you don't need a very precise channel model to predict the signal propagation or the attenuation or the like the uh, propagation loss. So the semi-empirical formula actually gives a good approximation of the channel without going through all the details of the environment and also the channel, like the channel conditions. So, and often like uh, in order to get a precise idea of the signal propagation in, in the water, like we also, we often, we need to consider the, um, the sound speed profile, SPI. So basically like uh, you need to consider the depths of the water, the underwater contour environment, and the, the temperature, pressure, and the salinity level and all these factors need to be considered. But whereas in some applications which we don't need that precise information, we want a quick method which can describe the channel, which we can just use for the like a networking aspect of research. So we consider the semi-empirical formulas. And so basically transmission loss can be computed in this way, which consider the distance and also the uh, absorption loss. And uh, different case, basically corresponding different propagation models. For example, if K equal to one, it's like a cylindrical. So it's kind of more like the uh, directional antenna kind of effects. Well, K equal to two, it's kind of spherical. It's more like the omnidirectional antenna signal just propagate all directions, whereas 1.5 gives a transition range, like a true region, which kind of just falls in between. 
So we verified how this empirical formula and the uh, semi-empirical formula versus a Ray theoretical model, like how precise this model can be used to describe different channels, we, like a, which, where the, the Ray theoretical model give a more precise description. So we did a simulation and we considered the sound speed profile in the Newfoundland region, like in this area, in this region. And we considered the shallow water scenario, like, a, like a basically up to 100 meters. And those are deployed at 10, 25, 50, 90 meters from the ocean surface and also deep environment because North Atlantic Sea is a deep water, like easily they go to three, 4,000 meters depth, not far from the shore actually. And uh, so the nodes are located at the, near the surface, 10 to 75, or in the middle of 15, and also near the bottom of the ocean, like a 20, uh, all close to uh, 3,000 meters. And the, the horizontal distance, 3,000 meters, and also the, we use the omnidirectional sound source, 30K. Basically, this compares the semi-empirical formula with the, uh, like the uh, Ray theoretical model, and the, uh, so for the uh, depths of uh, for shallow water, so basically we can see here the semi-empirical uh, formula matches like uh, the basic k equal to one point five matches well with the like the different like this is a uh, incoherent, this is the uh, uh, semi-coherent, and this is a coherent. So basically, it matches well with the semi-coherent of the like the transmission loss you did the ray theoretical model. And this matches well for all scenarios, for the near the surface, in the middle, and also near the bottom, for the shallow water scenario. And whereas for deep water, and actually like we can see it, uh, when the node deployed near the surface, actually it's quite dramatically it drifted quite dramatically. And uh, mainly like, uh, and all other scenario, it matches the, co uh, the uh, Co coherent model of the ray theoretical model. And the, the reason to explain that is mainly like the ones that the uh, node are located near the surface, basically the transmitter, receiver both near the surface, and the, the signals got reflected by the sea ocean surface, and then basically travels a deep distance to the floor, sea floor, and that causing the drifting. And the, whereas when node are deeper into the ocean, like uh, into the 750 or 15, or near the uh, bottom of the, uh, that effect is much reduced. So uh, it's more consistent. So basically that gives us a picture. We can use the semi-empirical formula with different k's, k, point, uh, k equal to 1.5 in the case, like uh, for the shallow water, where, whereas k equal to two, like uh, when in the uh, deep water for the study. So like, uh, that's actually like uh, we verified, and then we start, we used in our work. And then next next problem we look at is the weight, like energy, energy efficient asynchronous wake up speed. So basically, uh, the node like we are talking about long term deployment. We want the nodes city, uh, like a, a deployed in the water for a year, maybe even three years. And uh, even though we have energy harvesting, like a, like a using the turbine, but still, um, like a, the battery won't. Like we want to be uh, energy efficient as much as possible. So basically, the idea is we want put the node to sleep as much as possible, and when wake up, it do the sensing and collect the data and the, check the communication. But we want the node to sleep as much as possible, but we don't want to lose the network connectivity because if like a node sleep, they cannot communicate over time, and then basically the functionality of the network is gone. So. Basically, the idea is that we are want ensure network connectivity, but we want to conserve energy as much as possible by putting the node to completely sleep or like a shut down everything. So basically, the design we are uh, we are focusing on the long term monitoring application. We design the operation of the node into two modes. One is a wake up mode, so basically we call it active slot, and uh, then sleep mode, putting the active slot. A sensor node, like each node, we uh, designed to alternate between a predetermined active slot and inactive slots. So the basic design is in active slot, the node wake up, sensing, do the sensing, send, receive data requests, listen to the channel to see if any nodes, uh, any data need to be received. Whereas the inactive slot, we turn off the transceiver completely, 
so that the maximum like maximize energy saving. So and each cycle of the node basically it come from the two uh, like a mod uh, composed of multiple slots and basically we design the slot to be on and off so that we make sure the network connectivity is maintained. And uh, each slot we have the same duration. So basically we use the concept of a CDS cyclic cyclic, cyclic different set. So the basically the cyclic different set is based on the singles uh, theorem. So we, if we design, uh, we pick a prime number Q, design the V, K, lambda. V is the total number of cycles. K is the number of cycles that the node will be awake, like active. And we guarantee lambda cycles overlapping. So between any nodes, we can maintain like a connectivity. So the, basically the algorithm like we designed is like we use the uh, one cycle of node includes that many slots and the Q plus one number of slots is active slot. And under basically using this mechanism, any cyclic shift, whether it's synchronous or asynchronous. Synchronous means the, the time slot are can, uh, can, uh, strictly bounded with a boundary. Whereas asynchronous, it can be partially shifted. And so, and we guaranteed the connectivity of all nodes within the network are connected. At least one cycle, uh, like a basically a Q plus one cycle, basically here, uh, here, like a, we, we can guarantee is a one cycle can be common. So any nodes can communicate with other nodes in the neighboring area when they wake up. And so we can further extend using chronic products to basically to dilute the cycle to be awake so that maximize the chance the node will be asleep. Okay, so basically this is a 731 uh, cyclic different set here. So basically the cycle of each node comprised of seven slots, three slots they will be awake. And the one, like one slot we guaranteed any cyclic shift of this pattern will guaranteed like there's one common slot, two nodes will can wake up together and they can communicate. So basically here, like this is seven three, a seven three one CDS. So that's like basically any shifts we can see that's guaranteed one black slot, which is active slot, they will connect. What we designed is we take this like a basically seven three one from the original CDS. We make like a we pick two out of each cycle, then we concatenate them together for this one. So basically, instead of seven, three, seven slot have three active slot, basically over 21 slot, we have six active slots. Basically, it's a reduced duty cycle further. And then even with that, we can use a chronic product to further dilute this. So make it the node that can basically have more time to sleep, whereas a little time to, uh, to wake up. But we guarantee that when they wake up, any nodes they want to talk to, there are two common slots. They can uh, wake up at the same time to guarantee the connectivity. Okay, so the performance evaluation, like we have the data rate, 500 bits, uh, 5,000 bits per second, transmission power 20 watts, receiving power three, idle listening uh, 0.08, and the sleeping, basically, the complete the transceiver is completely turned off, but the amount of data we send is little. And the idle listening is actually non-trivial, it's non-negligible. So basically what we are trying to do is we want to put the node to completely sleep so that we save more on the idle listening power side, energy like associated with idle listening side. So, but for the transmitting, basically that depends on how much data you want to transmit or how much data you want to receive. You cannot save much on that part, but mainly we save idle listening power. So basically here, this is uh, the result. Basically you can see this is a black one is a tile, uh, the energy consumption for the um, associated with transmitting data and uh, the, the gray, like a deep, uh, darker gray side shows the energy consumption for the uh, receiving and this is uh, idle listening. So basically like a through reducing the duty cycle of nodes, the, the uh, energy associated, uh, energy consumption associated with idle listening greatly reduced. And also we compare it with other work and our proposal work we can see like a, basically we can achieve like a better energy efficiency like a, consume less energy than other proposed method in this area 
And the, the second, uh, the next one we look at the balancing the robustness and the energy consumption. So the idea, the objective is to balance between the network robustness and the energy consumption. So basically, to save energy, we want to reach as far as can possible. So basically, the network density needs to be reduced. Whereas to provide more robustness, we have need more nodes nearby. So basically, we need to increase the, the density of the network. So and so basically, like a, that, that's a we want to strike a balance between these two. And often, because to achieve better energy efficiency, we want to put nodes as far as possible. And even though we locate, like a, the location of the deployment is selected, but it can be drifted, like a node can be drifted by the current, or when deployed, it may not be accurate as as this, uh, designed for, deployed from the ocean floor, ocean, ocean surface. And also, the contour of the ocean floor is not flat. It's not, it like it may be drifted away from further away, so it may be out of the range. And so, we, like a, it, um, so that's a problem. So basically, redundant load, and uh, uh, we need in that case, and all the novel node deployment strategy, we need to have the uh, to to consider to improve the robustness. So basically, we derive the uh, we define the robustness in terms of all the possible route for the neighboring nodes, and uh, considering the um, the ratio of the like R and D basically showing how the density of the network should be, and uh, so basically we can see that if say the sensor nodes are deployed, we know the distance, but there's a deploy when they deploy, they have the error contained. So if the error follows a Gaussian distribution, so around the designated location, then the two nodes, their distance basically between them follows the arising distribution. So basically we uh, and say we define a scoring function here, basically give different weights of the robustness and the energy like a, in terms of robustness or the uh, in terms of number hops basically to save the energy. And so this is uh, uh, to the designated location or with a large deploy deployment error. And uh, so we show the result with different weight for the robustness. Or you want to see more energy efficiency aspect of network, you pick the one which gives the best uh, solution. So for example, like the red one, if you purely consider. So it's more of a guideline handbook kind of uh, result we get here. And then we look at like the energy uh, efficiency for the relayed node selection. So we define a new routing matrix, basically to prolong the network lifetime. And the network lifetime is the amount of time that many nodes exhaust the energy. Basically, like a basically like a network lifetime is reflected by node lifetimes. So node depletes the energy and no longer can communicate. That's a time to declare the network lifetime is gone. So basically, it's a we don't want because relay nodes close to the sink, their battery consumption will be much more than the far away nodes. So we want to achieve this kind of balance. So we defined like a, a flow assignment, basically to consider the energy consumption and also the flow consumption conservation and the, the cost of the uh, link cost between the two nodes are de uh, defined as this for the node, relay node selection. And uh, we consider the multi-power levels because I like, uh, to initially, like uh, the node, we can use a relay function so the energy consumption can be reduced. Whereas when the nearing, nearby nodes to the sink energy is depleted, we want the like, uh, far away nodes to raise their power level to reach further to the sink directly or like a few hops to reach. So basically like, uh, that's the idea we want to achieve. So basically, we have uh, three power levels, and we use the EvoLogix modem, and the receiving power, auto listening power remain the same. And this is a result. We show like a basically, uh, if you purely focusing on, on the energy consumption conservation or uh, like the uh, robustness, neither give the best answer. Whereas the, like a, in the middle, reaching a balancing between them gives a good. Uh, like the efficiency. So basically, this measured in the number of packets, data packets transmitted by the network when the network dies. And also, this side shows how many packets are using the low power transmission, low level 
power transmission, how many packets are transmitting using the high level power levels. So, and on uh, different results. And uh, so, and also like uh, basically here shows uh, the number of packets can be transmitted using single power level is quite low. Whereas two power levels already, like it's much more, uh, much uh, significantly improved. Three power levels can further improve, but the enhancement will be less. So it makes sense like for underwater modems, like I have a supporting multi-power levels to achieve better results. And some uh, other results I would just uh, skip here. And also like here, like we consider the like non-uniform power, like a battery, like a energy allocation. So basically if using the same energy level, power level, like a power supply for all nodes, it may not give the best answer, but nodes near the data sink, like a closer, they have their own traffic, they need to relay the traffic. So basically we can re, uh, like a, we can redistribute the power, like a, the, like the, the, the battery. So that to, that can achieve a better result. That's a difference. Like the black one shows this new scheme and the, which compared with the initial, like a unanimous, like a basically uniform power level, uh, battery level distribution. That's, uh, that's better. We can get better results. And finally, we look at a coordination scheme, uh, for data collection using the AUVs because the AUVs, uh, like are more efficient way of collecting data rather than having the node just a relay and sending the data out. That's consuming too much energy power. So the sensor, but the sensor node and the AUV, they're on the different cycle, uh, peer, uh, working cycles, and there's no synchronization between them. And the AUV only knows approximate location of the nodes, whereas the precise may not know. So basically, to work on that, the code, like basically the AUVs just uh, operate on the beacon listening, beacon listening because AUV can be retrieved and recharged. So. Basically, we don't need to conserve energy on that side. Whereas the nodes basically wake up, sleep, and wake up for a short period and sleep for as much as possible. So what we do here is the, uh, like a, uh, basically the past lens, we find out what's the optimal sleep time for the nodes that can maximize the node to sleep, whereas don't miss the AUV when it approaches. So basically the past lens is the intersection between the Trans, like, transmission region and the AUV. And if the AUV close to the, on top of the node, then the pass length will be longer. Whereas if come to the edges, the pass length is shorter. Basically interacting time will be shorter. And so basically the node need to, it means node need to wake up frequently to avoid missing the AUV when passing by. So basically we define the, opti we, like the goal is to find the optimum time for the node to sleep Whereas and uh, uh, to whereas not to miss the communication, so the utility function we define as a benefit and cost on both sides, and the so, and the we do treat that that optimum uh, problem, uh, optimization problem, and then like a further thought we had is uh, uh, when the AUV first like a the beacon was received by sensor node instead of having AUVs just a pause in the region. Basically, you know, like underwater AUV won't be able to stop. Basically, in order to communicate, just swirl around the area, basically to continue the communication. So, but it could be letting, like if we could let the AUV get closer to the node as much as possible. Basically, like we can achieve a better bandwidth and more energy efficiency. So basically, like we have a method deployed here is, uh, so once we receive, the, uh, the sensor node will give them some induction, like basically uh, kind of a, uh, uh, assistance tone signal, which makes AUV approaching further closer to the node. So basically AUV will check its signal strength. And uh, as long as like when it's getting a signal, uh, the tone signal are getting stronger, it just approach further until come to a location, the signal can start to decrease. And then it just uh, swells around the region. So basically this is a way it's kind of a, uh, we, uh, it's kind of a blind landing system. So the radar signal propagate, like a basically goes to the aircraft, a pro, like a make a guide the aircraft to get closer and, uh, uh, to the, to the airport. So it's kind of this mechanism. We use that for the AUVs to get approach closer to the nodes. So this is, uh, and we can see the node can sleep time can be maximized. Whereas on this node, on this graph, when the pass length is very rough, like a basically from 200 to 2000, very rough range, 
the time for the sensor node to sleep are just much reduced. So basically it means the sensor node needs to wake up frequently to monitor in order to not miss the AUVs. And we can see like the accurate location of the nodes when the AUV deployed will have much impact on the energy consumption or the uh, maximum the amount of data transmitted. All right, so basically like here we uh, studied the different aspects, mainly on any prolonged network lifetime. And, uh, and even though like we studied a regular topology, it can be extended for a non-regular topology. Basically, the work is not, even though like we know, pond water, that's a, a, that's a way to go often because of the restrictions, cost, challenging environment, but it can be also, uh, the work is not the same. So that's some future work and actually quite a future a number of work we are doing is uh, now we use uh, array signal processing, array network for the underwater communication network because uh, collaborative communication, collaborative localization and tracking, and also um, that gives uh, a lot of benefits. And the uh, recent work actually, like uh, we also, we work on using the OFT, LTFS, for the underwater localization, tracking, and the communication. So that's something recent work we are currently working on. Uh, I think, sorry for the delay here, and uh, it's a bit long, and uh, I, uh, I think I will just stop here. Maybe just one quick second is I will show you a, a video we did for the informatics project. So, so I'll just do a, this one will be a short, like two minutes, two minutes video. So this is the sensor we designed from the project. So you have a turbine harvesting and the bottom part is for the deployment. So the turbine is used for the free fall deployment. So even though we didn't use that, like in the real development the deployment, but this can be used for deep ocean environment. And we developed the power harvesting system, basically based on the one meter per second uh, current. It can generate, I think the lab test showed that it can generate a hundred watt. And one meter per second, um, it can still generate a decent amount of power for the use. And this is the for the open components, and uh, we can make a, uh, we can form an array network underwater. And the modem we tested roughly beyond two kilometers. It's hard to maintain the communication link. So I think in all our work considered here, it's roughly in between two between one to two kilometers distance between the nodes, and the nodes has a vertical uh, communication. So basically, two links, one horizontal. And the, the, when you reach the service buoy, it can just use uh, the satellite link for communication. And then we have the acoustic release mechanism. So the weight can be released and the whole unit, whole sensor can be retrieved. And this is a tank test mainly to test the energy harvesting. Okay, so okay, how the, um, in the, our flume tank facility here, okay, so basically how much power can be generated. And this is uh, like a, the real deployment. And we use the Sonodyne uh, acoustic modems. And these sensor nodes, like we call the sensor nodes, but you know, like it's different from the traditional sensor node. So that's how it's deployed. Uh, and uh, we, like after the $3.4 million project, we have the funding from ExxonMobil and to continue basically prototyping this. And uh, that's uh, another uh, couple million dollar projects. So we made some additional nodes. So, and the, the nodes are not small, like a 500 kg in the air. And uh, uh, basically, uh, I just go back a little bit here. 500 kg uh, in the air, 400 kg in the water. And we have to have a crane arm to deploy. So it's not like the regular sensor network, like the cheap uh, finger, like the nail size sensors. And it's uh, underwater, everything is totally different. Anyways, I will 
stop here and uh, I'll take questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Cheng. Um, Uh, thank you very much. Um, absolutely fascinating. Um, really interesting. Um, I'll open the door for questions. Um, I guess we have time for two or three questions, Max. Anyone has any questions? I, my, my question, uh, with my question, Professor Cheng. Um, a couple of years ago, I, I, um, I had a friend um, who proposed his mass is, is, is too far. Um, but, but it's still still far, you know, compared to the oceans, right? So oceans um, represent over 70% of, of our planet, and yet we don't know much about them. Um, I guess my, my question here is, you know, or, you know, trying to explore the, 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 the ocean. Well, I uh, had some problem of, uh, hearing your question. It's kind of a... Uh, right, can okay. You, uh, is it clear? Can you, yeah, 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 I think the microphone actually gives a problem, like, but uh, uh, when you talk to the computer, that's a lot better. Yeah, I think there's an echo. So, so my, my question yeah. was, um, um, some people are looking into activity on Mars and, and the Moon. Okay. Yes, yeah. Those are, you know, uh, 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 oceans are closer to uh, the Moon and, or Mars. Um, my question was, yes. you know, from, from you, you uh, you've been looking into this for quite a long time. Do you think, you know, there's more potential in knowing or, or understanding or, or, let's say, you know, controlling our oceans, our waters, than, than the moon or Mars? Okay, uh, thank you. That's a good way. <laughs> we, we, we migrate, we move to Earth, like a Mars, or to the moon, like I suppose we have a human beings uh, like a, you know we exploring those planets but bringing any resources back from those pro like a, those planets for our needs on the earth is just uh, impossible what's the cost like it's like, a, like unless they move to that planet then okay it makes sense to do more exploration and the finding the local resource to support the community. Whereas bringing from outside to support our existing, the planet Earth, so the resources we need on the Earth is just a crazy idea. But exploring the ocean is not something like it's close and the resource are not only from the ocean. The human for general, like for the is hundred years, thousand years, and for many things we don't know. It's uh, there are lots of resources under the ocean, which we can explore. So I think from that perspective, like uh, why we forget about something nearby, near to us, which we can find out, understand more, and get up, uh, get uh, use it to support the human society, rather than go far away, feel a few. Millions of miles away, and unless the society we decide everybody we move to the Mars, and I think maybe it's a serious time to think about how to explore the resources in the Mars to support us. But I think that it makes more sense here to think about the ocean, what we can do to use the ocean in a responsible way. To explore the resources to support us, I think that I, I, I think that's my view. Uh, I think the ocean will be a more beneficial and immediate support to us than any in the space in the universe. Right. Okay. Thank you much. So, so, so basically, the uh, my understanding is, let's focus on our ocean for now. Yeah, yes. You. Yeah. I, I, I would, I would strongly advocate this because, uh, like a. Terrestrial, sure, we've done so much, and uh, like, uh, let's focus on the ocean. We have plenty of resources from the ocean. We should be able to like, uh, find out what... Uh, ...use in the For example, like, uh, I uh, share with you, you know, we did the test in the pond. So when you say, we, say we did one to 20 for transmission, like we we tuned to ten watt transmission power, so we deployed.
consider like uh, if the if the ocean ridge like uh, if it's in mountain area under the water then this could be different so we we may have to consider like a uh, how to you know, deal with that because uh, if it's the body like basically the signal won't come out and uh, you have to consider like uh, not using a regular topology but i think a graph uh, okay okay thank you uh, second uh, small question if uh, uh, we choose uh, uh, another type of channel uh, uh, optical channel mm -hmm. instead of uh, acoustic channel what happened in this yeah. chain in this uh, proposed chain well the uh, uh, the optical channel basically like you have you only the near like a very close region you can use i don't think it goes well like uh, when it's further away and like a first in the in the water it's not just a clear water without on like a on, on any like a, uh, what's a obstacles like a basically block the signals propagation so basically like a, only when used the nearby but the benefit using it is uh, bandwidth is high so basically that's what we consider like if any two methods need to be used together for example using the AUVs for data collection we can get close to the sensor nodes so basically like a it's kind of joint use the acoustic and the optical provide a good way of doing so we use acoustic for navigation for basically guidelines uh, AUVs get closer to the nodes then use the acoustic like use a laser or like the optical to download the data in the like a, it's still tetherless like we don't make a connection between the nodes it's tetherless but we can download the data in a much faster speed than acoustic so i think this would provide a better way of uh, like a combining the technologies but using alone for long haul i don't uh, see it's a feasible way of doing improve the life network with the isolated nodes. Thank you, Apostle. Okay, thank you very much. Right, okay, so um, I guess uh, with this we um, end um, our um, session here. Thank you very much on behalf of everybody here. Thank you very much, Professor. <laughs> Thank you, everyone, and uh, thank you very much. Uh, I wish you. next time I'll be able to go there in person and in see person, everybody. Yes, okay. so we would love to see you here. Uh, thank you very much, and uh, see you soon again. Thanks. Thank you, Shane. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you thank very you. much. Um, I, thank you. Bye. I can also see Professor uh, Rizke here, so I'll probably kick off our next keynote as well. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Shane Lee. Have a nice day. Okay, I will assign uh, the floor. Okay, sorry, please. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, how are you? Doing very well yourself. Thank you. So, uh, thank you a lot for uh, joining us, and we apologize for the uh, delay. So, uh, we had the uh, Today for our uh, four keynote, uh, you can uh, share okay. share your your screen. Yeah, absolutely. I I think I can. Yeah. Uh, um... Thank you, uh, Dr. Rizki, for accepting to, to give the talk. And we, uh, again, uh, we apologize, apologize for the delay. Uh, uh, the Dr. Rizki will give a talk entitled Obstacle Wireless Communication, uh, Secrecy, and uh, Learning Based Design. Uh, I just uh, want to review some uh, thing to see some words about uh, Professor Rizki. Uh, Professor Verreske is uh, an assistant professor at uh, Electrical and Computer Engineering Department at the University of uh, California, Santa Cruz, and uh, he spent uh, several time, several time in several places. I just mentioned a few of them: University of uh, uh, Computer Electrical and Mathematical Science uh, at uh, King. Uh, Abdullah uh, also spent uh, one year in uh, University of uh, British Columbia. Uh, Dr. Rizki received uh, a 
le prestigieux fond, le fond de Québec de la recherche sur euh, euh, la nature et les technologies. Uh, he is a, he has been the editor of e e wireless communication letters and he served as a chair of several symp symposium of uh, at many IEEE flagship conference. So th there's a lot of things to say about uh, Dr. Rizqi. Uh, I think that we maybe we can move directly to the pre presentation and thank you a lot for accepting uh, our invitation. I give you the floor, uh, Dr. Rizqi. Thank you very much for the presentation. It's a pleasure to be among you guys. My name is Zuhair Reski, as the presenter mentioned. I am, and I hope also you can see my slides, right? Nice. So we will be talking about optical wireless communication, and I'll be zooming specifically on security and learning-based design. Uh, first of all, I'd like to acknowledge uh, my colleague, Professor Slim al from Kaos, my colleague, Professor Anas Shaban from UBC Kelowna, and my former students, Murtaza, Wael, and Ahmed, and my current PhD student, Abdurrahman, basically for their work without whom this work would have never been achieved, okay? So this is the outline of my presentation. I'm gonna start by a brief introduction and motivate the problem. And then uh, on the heart of the problem, I start looking into physical and statistical channel model, give you a brief overview on single user capacity and highlight how it is different from the standard AWGN channel. And then I'll be zooming on physical layer security or what we call also information theories of security in optical wireless channel, and give you a few snapshot results that we developed and also highlight uh, other concurrent work. And then at the end, I'm going to be focusing more on learning based design or specifically to optical wireless communication. And I finish with some concluding remarks and future directions. So, our goal as communication engineer is to achieve a very high data traffic, very high rate demand, and better reliability and low latency. So, we have so many. Hello? All right. So, and we would like to achieve this knowing that we have, we are facing so many challenges, in, uh, including increasing the data demand, the RF spectrum, RF spectrum basically is in shortage because we've, we've, we've essentially exhausted all RF spectrum. And we also were engineers, so by definition with 3D, we'd like to achieve those goals with less complexity and less cost as much as, as less as possible. So since we have done so much in terms of signal processing and communication information theory for the RF channel, so we are pretty much, we're pretty much, uh, for some reason I hear my echo, I don't know why. <laughs> All right. As long as it doesn't bother you, I'm fine. I'm fine with it, but as long as it doesn't bother you. <laughs> So we, we did pretty much everything in, in, the, in RF, at least from uh, point to point, and even in some much user setting, we're running at full capacity. So we cannot do much at, at RF, and we are not going to start slicing the slice. So potentially what we're looking for, we're looking for some open U band, like millimeter wave, terahertz, and optical, and optical bands. And among those new technologies, I believe, and other, like, likewise others also, that optical is the most mature because research has, has been going on for quite maybe 30 years or more, okay? And with this, we can achieve dense network, dense network using smaller cell and dedicated high-speed wireless links. So the optical wireless communication essentially exploit the wide and free optical spectrum. It is free at least for up until now, we don't know in the future, but it is free now, why don't you exploit it? And if we do, then we're gonna achieve dense network, more, more backhauling links, that's where we can use laser communication to achieve high data, basically rate in backhaul with less infrastructure and low cost. Optical communication also is a, is a good candidate for last mile problems 
basically when we we need to convey so much data pipes into into an access point and small cells also are feasible using optical communication in the sense that optical aqua cells using light emitting di diodes basically that could be used both for data transmission and illumination and on the top of this optical communication is not necessarily does need does not need necessarily to be used alone it can complement very well uh, or already deployed rf technology so i hope by now i i basically i convince you that optical is something that is worth investigating and then we're going to look now into what are the conceptual difficulties and challenge in terms of statistical and channel model for us as engineers so what is optical wireless communication for those of you who don't know i'm sure most of you know what is optical communication already so this is a wireless communication is optical signals only um, we're not covering here uh, no fiber so we assume that there is no fiber. okay and for optical communication there is there, there are two type of detection the first one is the so-called intensity modulation direct detection okay which is basically the main mode of detection for a free space optical system it doesn't require any adaptive control system and hence why it is appealing it is very easy to deploy on the other hand we have more powerful detection which is coherent modulation and heterodyne detection this provides more basically performance if you will however it is it requires strong adaptive control basically in the carrier phase and state and polarization and this is basically something that play against the coherent detection and hence why most of the research basically you will see and deployment as well you will see more the intensity modulation direct detection imdd for short so in a sense in a sense what we what we do to send to send uh, uh, information via a, a wireless optical link. We have here at this point, we have an electrical signal, basically that we are going to convert into an optical signal using electro-optical conversion. And then we send, so we send the optical signal through the channel, okay? At the receiver, we do exactly the opposite thing. So we convert the optical signal into into an electrical signal and then we, we we feed it to the receiver and the receiver should basically estimate what has been transmitted okay so keep in mind please that what we send we send the intensity of light and we receive intensity of light as well so and we will see later on what are the implication of those of those physical realities all right so in, in coherent optical wireless communication, information bearing, bearing signal is an optical intensity and the receiver is a light intensity detector, okay? This is simple as we've said before, okay? Lower cost and easy deployment, but there is a fundamental difference from RF and coherent optical communication. And hopefully by this talk, I will at least convince you what are those fundamentals and highlight them. So we need to understand those fundamentals and difference with, this, with, with the classical RF communication and their co consequences. And for that, we will start by the channel model first. Let's look at the channel model, essentially. So we, when we send in light, we send in photons, basically, right? We send in a set of photons, and the receiver, basically, its job or its task is to count those photons. So in principle, the process consists of photon counting and then you already see that essentially photon counting basically most of the time it is modeled as a poisson distribution so we will see the implication of this as well so we transmit an optical power p0 this is an optical power not an electrical power so p0 is the optical power and we transmit at an average rate of xt photon per second So the receiver, as I said, is a photon counting type. So the photon arrival rate is a, a certain X. And because it's a photon arrival counting, so X must be positive, okay? There might be some background radiation noise that I'm gonna characterize as lambda. And lambda e here also is a positive. 
Lambda, you may think of lambda just a sort of mean of the arriving, arriving radiation noise, if you will. All right, so this is the counting at the receiver. The receiver, what does it do? At this time instant, there is no photon arriving, so it's zero. At this time instant, there is a photon arriving, so it's switched to one. At this time instant, another photon switched to two, and so on and so forth. So it's, it's, it boils down to counting the number of photons arriving at time instant K capital T and K plus one capital T. Okay. So with this being said, for a given X, for a given input, this for a given input intensity of light, Y given X is, is Poisson distribute that we can characterize as follows P of Y given X is exponential minus x plus lambda x plus lambda to the power of y by y factor okay and this is basically why i said at the beginning that this photon counting it has a has a poisson poisson nature so the capacity of the poisson basically although not fully not fully understood but it has been uh, studied in one and two So with, with, with y given x, the transition probability, the transition probability of the channel being Poisson given by this, this might be basically, this is the general model, but you may start assuming or, or basically uh, assuming some, some valid assumption like the high received power is very high, the x plus lambda is very large, in which case this this probability distribution will boil down to something like this that looks exactly like the Gaussian look familiar with. So P of Y given X if X plus lambda is very large is a is a Gaussian distribution of mean X plus lambda and of variance X plus lambda as well. Okay. Then this 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 in, this uh, pushes us to think that Y given X is a is a normal distribution. Okay of mean x plus lambda and variance x plus lambda. There is, there is a subtle, there is a subtle uh, problem here because we're used to AWGN channel when y given x does not depend on x. Unfortunately, in this new channel now, y given x depend on x through the mean and the, and the variance, and the, and the variance, okay? And that basically is going to Cause some some technical challenges in order to fully understand the capacity of this channel. So here, this approximation which comes from basically, if I take x plus lambda, this is p of y given x versus y, and as x plus lambda gets large, I am closer to a Gaussian distribution. Just to, uh, a way to to prove or to demonstrate basically this approximation. All right. So now we're left it to the fact that y given x is now an, a Gaussian noise with input x plus lambda and output x plus lambda, uh, with, in, with mean x plus lambda and, uh, and uh, variance x plus lambda. Please bear in mind that this lambda is the dark current intensity. Okay? And then we can write this animal, we can write this animal as y is equal to x plus square root of x z2 plus z1. So here the z2 basically is a noise that is due to the, the random random transmission of light, okay? And hence why this is basically depending on the input x. And z1 is a thermal noise that's due to the processing at the receiver, okay? So now y given x has the same distribution as this. Now this channel and this channel have the same capacity as well, okay? Let's keep in mind that Z2 is due to the randomness in the intensity of light at the transmitter, and Z1 is due to the thermal noise, basically. And you see here that there is a square root of X, just to fulfill the requirement of this input distribution. So the capacity of this channel as well has been studied in reference one, and it has been shown essentially that the input distribution is discrete, if, you will, if we have a peak and average intensity constraint. Now, if thermal noise dominates in this case, is if basically the variance of Z2 is very, very small in comparison to the variance of Z1, then we can absolutely ignore this term and we go back to the classic EWGN channel X plus Z, when Z now is completely uncorrelated independent with X, okay? 
I'm going to assume for now that z has mean and zero mean and varying sigma square, and I can write my channel model as follows. Okay. Why I'm why I'm telling you all this? This is a textbook material because because now I would like to emphasize on something very very important. That's because of the constraint of this channel. Keep in mind that x is positive because it's the intensity of light, so x cannot. In the classical IEWGN channel, we know that the optimal input is Gaussian. In this case, in this particular case for the optical wireless communication, X cannot be Gaussian because of the constraint of the channel. X must be positive. Whereas Gaussian, I have no certainty that it's going always to be positive. This is a very simple model, yet the capacity is unknown in closed form. There are bounds, there are bounds, but the capacity as per se. It is known that the discrete input is achieved the capacity, but as in closed form, it's not known. Now let's let's uh, let's focus more on the constraint. Okay, this is a this is a figure that shows the light versus the intensity of current, and you see that basically, if I keep increasing the intensity of current, I'm gonna go over the linear mode. So basically, I I like to stay in the linear mode of this curve. Okay. To avoid any sort of distortion at the receiver side, and hence why I will impose a certain peak current intensity, which is going to be translated as a peak optical intensity. Here we go. Now we have a peak constraint on the input X. Okay. Also, for safety reason, for safety reason, I have also an average an average constraint on the intensity of light, okay? This is for safety and illumination. So I can keep in mind, please, that this is not some one over n sum i from one over n x i square. This is sum one over n x i instead of x i square. x i square is known in RF. This is because I'm working with the electrical current. Here, because I'm working with intensity, so this is an average optical power. And this is itself also is going to induce is going to induce some some fund, fundamental challenges in, in with respect to the, the standard EWG and channel. So X basically is positive. Okay, why it's it's X plus Z, why it belongs to R, that there is no difference. Z is normal Gaussian noise, okay, but there is a peak on the intensity instead of the peak on the power that we are familiar with in RF. And there is a peak, there is an average on the intensity instead of an average on the power we're familiar with. So for convenience, I'm gonna I'm gonna link those intensities, capital A and epsilon by a coefficient alpha. And whether alpha is greater than one half, only the peak is going to be active. If alpha is smaller than one half, the peak and the, and the average are both going to be active. So this is to say that all the channel input output is stand is similar to the standard EWGN channel. Okay. The constraint, the constraint, the peak and the positivity constraint along with the average make it completely different from the standard EWGN channel. This affects the capacity and affect also the coding scheme and performance error probability and everything. And this is to say also that for this channel, for this channel. This famous formula C is equal to log of one plus S on R is not valid anymore. Okay, because that formula has been obtained assuming that X is a Gaussian distributed. Here X cannot be Gaussian distributed for due to the due to this constraint. Okay, so those slides are basically of tutorial kind, is just to, to mention what is the capacity. And I believe everybody in, in the audience here is pretty much familiar with the capacity we need. We need to encode those bits in order to achieve capacity. Otherwise, we're going to be facing a large error probability. And then in order to map this to code words as well and to, and to pump so many bits in each code words, I, I need to make the code words as large, as long as possible in order to be distinguishable, in order for those code words to be distinguishable at the receiver. So this is basically no big deal. We're all familiar with this. So this takes us to the capacity definition. And again, here, no big deal. We would like to transmit a message that we encode into a, a sequence of a sequence of code word Xn that we send through the channel. I'm going to assume here that the channel is memoryless. So it's 
is completely determined determined by p of y given x. The receiver will see a sequence y n and is going to decode y n, hopefully to get an m hat, which is an estimate of m, m that is equal to what has been transmitted. And we, mis we measure the reliability of this scheme by the error probability, basically, which is the probability that m hat is different of m. Okay? Is equal to 1 over n log 2 of the cardinality of the message set, which is mn, bit per transmission, so that there exists a code, there exists a mapping, encoding, and decoding scheme that achieve a very small error probability as n goes to infinity. Okay. So we need basically to, to prove this result, to, to prove the capacity, and that the, the, the proof is standard basically. I'm going to generate a distribution, encode the message using IID in an ID fashion, and at the receiver I use either a maximum likelihood or the less complex, the less complexity typical set encoding in order to determine M hat. And basically if I do that, I do, a, a, I do an, a, 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 an averaging over all code to show that error probability goes to zero, and hence I will conclude that there exists at least one such code that achieved this performance and this performance is going to be captured by the mutual information between the input X and the output Y. And here is the result that had been established 50 or 60 years ago by Shannon. Basically, C is the maximum of I of X comma Y, and you maximize over all input distribution P of X, probability mass function, if you will, P of X. So because X is constrained to a positivity and a peak, and because the average intensity is constrained over the epsilon. As I said before, the capacity of this channel is not equal to log of one plus s m. Okay, not cannot be Gaussian with a finite number of mass points. So you may, you may think of an input discrete basically as p one delta x plus p two delta x minus a certain a one plus p p three delta x minus a certain a three, where the p i's are the probabilities and the a i's are the mass point location. Okay, that's the meaning of discrete number of number of mass points. And that basically, if you optimize over that input, we can see that this is the best we can do, and this is the, the scheme that achieved the best. And it's provable at least. Now, with this, with this being said, I hope by now I convinced you that there is this, this fundamental challenges that we encounter in optical wireless communication that makes it completely different from RF communication. And we can also include fade in, we can include everything that we do in, in typical standard RF, we can include it here. There is a large body of work that's basically focused on that kind of research. Now let's let's zoom a little bit on physical layer scripts in optical wireless com communication. And I'm gonna I'm gonna talk more about the input dependent noise and the Poisson, Poisson channel noise. Okay. By now we're familiar with what, what do I mean by this. So conveying confidential da data through a communication channel is an issue for system engineer and privacy and uh, basically security is a big challenge that basically emerging all over the world, especially in US here and, and I'm assuming everywhere. So it has been shown that basically information theoretic security is a solution to securely transmit messages, confidential messages, and it's a solution in the sense also that it can sometimes complement uh, existing crypto systems okay what's the what's the magic what's the what's what's the magic how can we achieve this how we can achieve confidential transmission of messages well basically in in our transmission in a, any typical communication system there is some randomness inherent randomness in the noise inherent randomness in the channel gain now, if we can somehow exploit that randomness to our advantage, then we can achieve, we can make basically the legitimate receiver or receivers have, have this advantage over a wiretap, basically, over the bad guys, okay? If we know how to exploit it at the transmit. That's basically the idea, okay? This is an appealing approach in decentralized network, ad hoc network or IoT network, when basically deployment of or management of the key or deployment of existing crypto system is not feasible okay 
So let's 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 little bit uh, be more mathematical, and I'm really sorry for that. We have a message that I would like to transmit. I'm going to encode it as as usual, and I'm going to add basically this noise dependence, this input dependent noise. Okay, and I'm going to add also uh, an input independent noise, exactly as we explained previously. And then this will, the legitimate receiver will, will see a sequence while n from which he's going to estimate w hat. And hopefully, if he does good job, if it does good job, what w hat is going to be similar to w. On the other hand, wherever I'm sending, there is somebody else who is listening to that. Hopefully through a different channel, so there is a different noise in E, in B is for, uh, for Bob, and in E is for, for, uh, for E, if you will, okay? Through a different channel, and there is also an input independent noise that is denoted in E0, and the input dependent noise is, de is denoted as in E1, okay? Here, basically, the Gaussian, uh, everybody is Gaussian with zero mean and sigma EI or sigma EI squared. Okay, and I'm gonna connect the sigma B1 and sigma, and I'm gonna do this, convey this W to the legitimate to guess what has been transmitted, or basically just to get a random guess as if, as if he has no clue, as if Z, his observation didn't help him at all. That's basically what we would like to do. Now, a rate equivocation, pair, the rate for the rate of transmission, and the equivocation measures basically how uncertain the eavesdropper is about the message. So the rates are measure basically how much information bits I am able to pump through this channel, through this pipe. And the equivocation measures basically how much, how, how ignorant the eavesdropper is about the message that you, okay? So a rate equivocation couple or tuple R and R is achievable if there exists a sequence of code indexed by length n to the power of 2 to the power n R such that the reliability constraint, which is pretty, which we are pretty much familiar with, holds true. I need this probability goes to zero to be equal to zero as n goes to infinity. And I need also on the top of this, this is a new constraint, the security constraint that suggests that the rate equivocation should be no smaller, no larger than at most equal to the entropy about W given Zn. So you may think of this as the level of the normalized level of uncertainty about W that the eavesdropper is getting is getting out of the Zn, out of the sequence that we see. All right. And we will, we will say that R is perfectly secure if the equivocation is exactly equal to R. If those, if R is equal to R and E, then we will, we will talk about perfect secrecy. And in that case, one can easily verify that the limit of the mutual information between the message and the observation of the eavesdropper is asymptotically equal to zero, meaning that W and Zn are asymptotically independent. So Zn doesn't get anything above W. And this is what we want. we want at the end of the day. This is what we want because we want the eavesdropper, although he sees basically, he or she sees the end, he will get nothing about what has been transmitted. All right, the secrecy capacity CS is the supremum of such rate. The supremum of rate where we have perfect secrecy basically. So now we have, we have, people have established, a researcher have established that discrete distribution with a finite support achieve the single user capacity, as we said before, without secrecy constraint, achieve the amplitude constraint, wired up channel with input independent noise, and achieve also the continuous time Poisson wired up. I'm going to basically come back to what we mean by continuous and discrete time Poisson wired up channel. For all this setting, discrete input are capacity achieving if you will. So now it is natural for it was natural for us to ask whether discrete distribution are also going to be capacity achieving for our setting when we have a wire top with input dependent noise when we have this. And that's what's basically the question that motivate this work. And the, answer, the, the response to this is to the affirmative yes indeed. And we get I'm gonna give more details in the upcoming 
but only but requires two auxiliary random variables u and v that are, we don't know how to find. Okay, so this problem is well solved. Okay, but the problem is computability. We we don't know. We know what is the capacity, but we don't know how to compute it. So practically, from a practical or from an engineering point of view, the, the previous work is is useless. It is not useless from a theoretical fundamental point of view, but is at least useless from a theory or from a practical engineering point of view. Now, now, if we have a sort of ordering between the legitimate user and the eavesdropper, keep in mind, please, that what I call legitimate user is this guy, and what I call eavesdropper is this guy. The, the, the good guy is the legitimate, the bad guy is the eavesdropper. All right, so this is basically conceptually a problem with the capacity computation, but, but, the problem is, if we have a sort of ordering between the legitimate use, uh, receiver and the eavesdropper, and when I'm, I'm talking about ordering, there are so many ordering in information theory. The more capable, the less noisy, the degraded, all these basically can be formally defined mathematically. Then now, the bottom of the line is to, to vary you the details. The bottom of the line is just, if we have a sort of ordering, then no such auxiliary random variable are needed. And we have basically the capacity in, 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 in the rate equivocation in, in, in this form, when only the inputs and the outputs are involved, as you can see. In this expression, only x, which is the input, and the output at the digital in the receiver, and the output at the eavesdropper are involved. So we don't have any uv, basically, auxiliary random variable. And this is what we want, because in, in the general case, the problem is extremely difficult to solve. Now, let's see when we will have this uh, this sort of ordering between the legitimate receiver and the eavesdropper. And just to put a, just to put uh, everything in perspective, we have solved this case, which is when sigma b one and sigma e one are equal and sigma e zero is greater. That meaning that the noise of the eavesdropper is larger than that. Of, at, the, at, the, at the legitimate receiver, this is the noise that is independent of the input. We have we have the solution. We have the solution in this case, since in this case is trivial, just capacity is zero. But all other cases, basically, there is no result. The results are unknown. Just to give you a, a flavor of it, how, how, how difficult the problem is. So if we have this condition holding true and this condition holding true, okay, this condition means that the inputs dependent noise on both channels are basically have the same variance and this assumption means that the input independent noise on the at the eavesdropper side is larger meaning that the eavesdropper side is no more noisier than than the legitimate channel okay in this case we have the markov chain x y and z meaning that the the channel is stochastically degraded if it is stochastically degraded, I'm just going to resolve resolve to this to this uh, characterization that does not have any auxiliary random variable to find what is the optimal input that maximizes this region. Very good. So now we have the stochastic degradedness with those conditions, and we have a full characterization that depends only on the input and the output. I know that the rate region by time sharing argument, it is a convex region. And I know in order to exhaust that convex region, it is enough to, to, to solve the following optimization problem. Supremum over all fx input distribution that satisfy the constraint. M plus here is the set of input distribution fx that satisfy the positivity. See here that I integrate from zero that satisfy the peak, see I integrate the bound of the integration is capital A, and that satisfy also the average, this is the average constraint which is equal to P. So I'm supervising this F mu over Fx, over all Fx belonging to this set, and the supervisation is a weighted sum, mu material information of X and Y, plus mu bar, or one minus mu, the material information x, y minus i of x comma z. Where this is coming from? Well, basically I'm trying to maximize mu times this bound plus one minus mu times this bound. If I do that, that I know that I'm going to exhaust the capacity. Okay. 
Now, this is a different optimization problem. It's a little bit different because I'm optimizing over input distribution. I'm not optimizing over the read set. Okay, and that makes the problem also a little bit more challenging and more complicated. Nevertheless, we have been able to solve it to, to the affirmative saying that this supremum actually is attainable, meaning that I can convert the supremum into a max, into a maximum. And then if I assume that this basically, this max is achievable by, achievable by certain fx star, okay, then fx star is first of all unique. Okay, this is coming from the strict concavity of this function. It is unique. And the support delta as the SFX star is finite set, meaning that X star, the optimal input distribution, it is discrete random variable with a finite number of mass points. Okay, so this is to answer the previous question. I told you that the answer to this question is to the affirmative. And here are the details. Assume now and I pursue. So the secrecy capacity CS, I can capture it by just setting mu equal to zero. In this case, I'm maximizing all only the difference between I of X comma Y minus I of X comma Z over all input distribution. This will give me the capacity CS. And CS also as a byproduct of this theorem is also achieved, achieved, achieved by a discrete input with a finite support. One little detail that could help us, that is going to help us basically to, to determine the input distribution for given peak and power is the fact that zero always belong to I times delta X is always a component of the input distribution. This facilitates a lot because when we run optimization problem, those, pro those, those kind of simulation are, are tricky. So the more you know, the better it's gonna help you to basically to find the solution, especially in the asymptotical regime, high SNR and low SNR. That's why. Same, this is for this, although this theorem is stated for peak, uh, peak intensity constraints only, but the same holds true also if we incorporate an average intensity constraint. And both these results hold true for, for with, with an additional average constraint. So if we look at some asymptotical result, low SNR, which is defined as the case when when the peak goes to zero, we can see, we can prove actually that asymptotically, CS is quadratic in A, in the intensity. So it's A squared times a certain constant. And please bear with me that this, this asymptotically equal is, is, is defined uh, very formally and very mathematically in the sense that it, I, I put this is equal, the left-hand side is asymptotically equal to the right-hand side if and only if the limit of the ratio between the left-hand side and right-hand side is equal to one when A goes to zero. So this is not an asymptotic, uh, asymptotic result that basically has no foundation. So this is a limit, limit asymptotic result. Let's keep in mind that it's the capacity is quadratic in A squared. The qu capacity also depend on this ratio between the average to peak intensity constraint, okay? Kappa is equal to epsilon by A, and depend also on a bunch of stuff that's about eta B and eta E that we define as the ratio between the noises at the legitimate receiver and the eavesdrop. So keep in mind also, please, that kappa equal to one half means that only the peak intensity is active and the average is not. All right. What happens if the peak goes to infinity and the average, the, the average also goes to infinity when, when the ratio uh, is held fixed. Then in this case, I can prove that the capacity is actually uh, upper bounded by a constraint, by a constant that doesn't depend neither on the peak nor on the average, meaning that the capacity is a, is a, is a big O of one, okay? So it's, it's saturated, it's a plateau, it's a sort of plateau. So here are the results essentially. So here I'm, I'm plotting the secrecy capacity in bits per channel used versus the intensity versus the intensity versus the intensity curve. The blue curve represents the secrecy capacity, whereas the black curve represents a lower bound, a formal lower bound that is nothing than the capacity you're going to achieve a lower bound, which is the black curve. It is interesting also to, be, to note that the right hand figure shows what we call the KKT condition, which is Crouch-Kuhn-Tucker condition, 
which in this case, given the complexity of the problem, is a necessary and sufficient condition for optimality. So what does this KKT tells us? It tells us that the CS minus a certain quantity that is well computable is always positive, and it is going to be equal to zero at the mass point. So here you see that it is always positive, and it hits the axe x at zero, at x equal to two, and at x equal to four. So zero, two, four are mass points, are optimal mass points in this case for capital A equal to four, and for this setting of the noises extension. So this confirmed basically what I said before that zero is always a point of, of the, of, on the support, okay? And it also says that the mat, the mat, the peak is also always in the support. So now what is the optimal or the optimal E2 delta X? Here is another snap, snapshot result for the crouch contact condition. I'm gonna be zooming on this curve now. If you look at this curve, this depicts the rate equivocation, the rate equivocation region. On the X axis is the rates R in bits per channel use. On the Y axis is R sub E in bits per channel use. And you see that this black curve basically is the rate equivocation. Any point inside the black curve is achievable. Any point outside the black curve is not achievable. This is for the case when A is equal to four. Where everything inside the blue curve is achievable. Everything outside the blue curve is not achievable. I would like to draw your attention to something very, very important. When A is large enough, I can never achieve this, the maximum RE and the maximum R at the same time. So if I would like to achieve the maximum E, and F, I need to drop a little bit on RE. And if I would like to achieve the maximum uh, uh, transmission rate, I need to give up a little bit on RE. However, when A is very, very small, when the intensity is very small, it turns out that, that I can at this point achieve both the maximum rate and the maximum equivocation, which is very, very interesting. Here is another snapshot result that, that just show our asymptotic results. On, on one hand, we plotted this, this right-hand side, and we plotted the left-hand side via simulation, and it turns out that they, co they coincide up until zero dB period, okay, for various values of A, okay? Just confirming this result. So, so now I, 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 I covered a little bit of the input dependent noise for the wiretap. I'm gonna go ahead and look at the discrete time Poisson wiretap chain. Before doing that, do you have questions, guys? No questions, okay. Yes? So, you, so your question is why why we're we focusing on the question why we're not trying other distribution. So, so, so basically, this is coming from the physical meaning of the transmission, right? This is coming from the physical meaning of optical wireless communication. So we said we were we said we previously that when we send light, when we send intensity of light, so this is basically photon, right? This is physics that tells us those photons. And at the receiver side, I'm counting those photons, right? At the receiver side, I think I, I need to, yeah, no. At the receiver side, I'm counting those photons. And this is what gives us basically the Poisson distribution. This is not something that we came up just out of, out of nowhere. This is the physical interpretation of communication that gives us that P of Y given X in this case is going to be Poisson. Did I answer your question? Mm -hmm. 
So, so basically, basically, when you're at the base station, you have a certain you have a certain user in the cellular network, right? So those users are are, are totally determined because the base station is sending some information to each user and each of those users are is complete, completely identified. So this they are, I'm going to call those legitimate users. Does this answer your question? No further questions? All right, thank you. So let's uh, let's give you a, a brief flavor of, about the optical channel. I think I'm running out of time, so I'm gonna I'm gonna do as fast as as possible, right? All right. This this is the Poisson, and Poisson is characterized by this input distribution P of Y given X and P of Z given X. Both are Poisson, but those Poisson are different because now the lambda be the dark current and the legitimate receiver is different than the dark current and the eavesdropper. And the channel gain la alpha B at the legitimate receiver is different than alpha alpha E. This is the channel gain at the eavesdropper. And here, here, what is a little bit uh, new and interesting that we include this delta. And delta in order to, to highlight the bandwidth constraint. So here we're not, you remember previously I, I talked to you that, I spoke to you that basically we have a characterization of the optical Poisson channel when we have infinite bandwidth, right? Mm -hmm. So infinite bandwidth basically is the case when delta converge towards zero. But in reality, we never have infinite bandwidth. We may have a very large bandwidth, but never infinite. So we decided to incorporate this delta to highlight basically that a constraint on the bandwidth. When delta converge towards zero, we have the results by Lawirin and Wagner that sh shows that the rate equivocation is basically achieved by, by two input, uh, by a discrete input with two mass points. And we actually solve it. I'm, I'm going to skip details because, in a sense, it's the same, similar details, although the proof, the technicalities of the proofs are completely different. Here I'm dealing with the, I'm dealing with Poisson distribution, which is one of the most complicated channel in information theory. But in essence, we can prove also that we have discrete input distribution achieve the capacity region. Those are details that I'm going to skip for the degradedness and the optimization problem, here is the result. Fx is unique and the support is a finite set, meaning that x star is a discrete random variable with a finite number of mass points. Surprisingly, if we drop the average power constraint, the, 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 the support is not finite. Anymore. We have discrete, discrete input, but the support is not finite. Anymore. But that's a different story. I will, I will skip it and maybe I can talk, it off, talk about it offline. As a byproduct, the CS is also achieved by discrete input distribution, and zero is always a mass point, as in the case of input dependence. Here also we have some asymptotic results, and the capacity scales quadratically with peak intensity constraint, and we have we have capacities equal to big O of one and the high is an average unit. There is a there is an independence of delta in this case which also has an, a physical interpretation. There are some a, a snapshot of results. This is, the, this, is the, this is the case when delta converts to zero. This is the result by, by Lawirin and Wagner, basically. And those are all curve. The, the, more, the, more, the larger delta is, the more constraints you put on your bandwidth, and the le less, less secrecy capacity you achieve. Okay? This, is also, this is for some value of alpha B and alpha E. And here also the mass point location at zero, at around three, at around six, at around 10. This is for the case when A is equal to capital. In capital A, the peak intensity constraint is equal to 10. Okay. So every time, this is the crucial count set of uh, condition. And if you would like to plot the rate equivocation region, then similar insight can be gained also in the optical channel. As I get this A very small, I can achieve both the maximum rate and maximum equivocation. <coughs> Sorry. And if A is large enough, I will have to do a compromise. I cannot achieve both at the same time. This is a snapshot of the secrecy capacity in the low SNR regime, just proving 
our asymptotical analyses, okay? And here are some related work, basically. We're not the only one who has who have been working on this. There are so many researchers also working on, on, on different problems. Beam forming from the MISO wiretap channel, input distribution for the MISO wiretap channel, the secrecy capacity bound for vi uh, uh, visible light communication. This is, a, this is basically a, a, a very good work. And we have so many reviews, basically this review, this is the review number four, and we have also a survey and tutorial that uh, has been published maybe last, uh, last semester. And we, we, are also, we have also this new result on the recertification for the signal independent noise and the degraded discrete time wipe channel in five and six. Uh, I believe six is in the review at TIT. Now I'm gonna focus on the last point, which is a learning based design. Learning based this opportunity for, for to optimize and to come up with the video. So it has been done in analytical intensity and average intensity constraint. So we try to learn how to modulate, we try to learn how to map the signal into code words, and at the end of this, which could be maximizing the rate, that's basically what we're trying to do, right? And there are several ways to do it. One way to do it is just this black box, which we call autoencoder. That's basically you consider that your whole communication system is a black box, an end-to-end -end performance, and you consider that this is a black box. You don't, you don't want another way that sees uh, the other, the other basically, uh, the other uh, strategy of design that says the following: I may not have access to both the transmitter and the receiver at the same time. If I have access at the receiver. What is the best I can do in terms of learning, given that the transmitter has done its, its, its own job? I have no inter model design fashion, basically, when the transmitter and the receiver are completely... Uh, I apologize, I cannot cite everybody. The wireless communication. Let's start with the single user, and at the end, I'm going to give you a flavor about the MAC channels, which is a, a multi-user setting. So we have a we have we have a message that we would like to communicate to the receiver, and then we're gonna make this message go through a transmitter based on deep neural network, full of multi multiple dense layer and activation function. There is also a normalization layer, okay, that takes care of the intensity constraint and the average intensity constraint. After that, the encoded symbol or the encoded code word, if you will is sent through a channel. Channel, basically, we know that channel is nothing than P of Y given X. And this is a this is a deterministic function, right? Given X, P of Y given X is a deterministic function that I can also map via a neural network, why not? And then at the receiver side, when I receive a sequence Y N, now I need to build multiple dense layer, dense layers with soft activation function in order to, de to decide in favor of a certain S hat, and I'm hoping that S and S hat are, are, are equal, essentially. Our performance here stick is going to be the block error probability, that this is what I'm gonna try to minimize in this sense. So here I'm just repeating myself, if you will. So the neural network transmitter has multiple dense layer, followed by a normalization layer, and multiple dense layer, they map, they map the generated bit into symbols. So every time I have a bit, I'm gonna map it into symbol, okay? And then I'm gonna normalize those symbols in order to, to satisfy the intensity constraint, okay? I'm gonna do the same for the channel. If the channel is EWGN, then things are easy. Otherwise, I can also map it with the, or, or approximate it with a neural network, okay? And I'm gonna do the same for the, at the receiver side, at the end, I'm gonna end up with a soft activation layer that produces a probability vector that is used for decoding. The highest probability I'm gonna, I'm gonna, decode, I'm gonna decide in favor of the symbol that has the highest probability. All right, so my rate of communication is k over n, so I have basically a set of messages that's one, two, until capital N, okay? So each S is represented as one hot vector, and what do I mean by one hot vector? This is the vector when 
in only one spot I have one, and everywhere else we, we have a zeros. This is of dimension n. So e to each to each message of this, I, I, I make a mapping with a certain s. Okay. And then the neural network, what it's going to do, it's going to map those messages, those messages to code word x. Okay. To code word x. And then after that, I'm going to make this x eyes go through a normalization layer. And I know that because I'm sending m messages over how many? Over n transmissions. Okay. So I'm sending log 2 of m, which is k divided by m. This is the rate of my transmission in bit per in bit per, per, per transmission if you use. And the channel layer basically is an EWGN, not necessarily always. This in this raw, but for this we started off with this with this basic uh, basic channel model. Here are the infrastructure the, 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 the structure or the layout of our autoencoder. We have an input and its dimension with so many layers. The performance is the bit block block error probability. Here are some results. We train our neural network at 10 dB only with a learning rate of 0 0.001. And here are the results. This is the block error rate versus row, which is SNR, from 0 to 15. And if I'd like to describe the curve from the from top to bottom, so the, the upper curve is the encoded on of k, 4 by 4 meaning k is equal to 4 and n is equal to 4. Here, basically, each code is described by kn or nk, if you will. Okay. And k is log 2 of m, m being the, the cardinality of the message set. So the upper curve is the encoded OOK for 4. The green curve is the encoded OOK to this one. And also the autoencoder 2 by 2 achieve also a better performance. Okay. Here we compare the same thing, block error probability versus SNR, but we compare with coded system. Okay. So now if I describe the curve again top to bottom, this curve is the encoded OK, exactly similar to this one. The red curve is the Hamming code OK74, meaning that my n is equal to seven, my k equal to they're working on more powerful Auto encoder system, and we've been able to not only to beat the Hamming 74 sub decision, but we are we have been able also to beat in performance the con some convolution encoders, some famous convolution encoders with the auto encoder. But the, the the design is a little bit more sophisticated. So the, the 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 message that I would like to convey here is what we have done in the last 60 years in terms of coding. We've been able to, with, with the help of neural network, we're able to basically to, to do, in some cases, to do better. Doesn't mean that what we have done in the past is, is, use, is useless, but it means that uh, learning-based design can make our life easier and can make design of powerful communication system way easier than what the classic way, basically, the model-based way. So, and then we try to extend the model to multi-user setting. When we have, when we have in essence two user, not jointly co-located, basically user one and user two, that are going to encode their message into code word X1 and X2 and send through the MAC channel. And at the receiver side, the receiver is observing a certain Y and is trying to decode from Y to, to detect basically which is S1 and S and S2. And hopefully S1 is going to be very close. S1 hat is going to be very close to S1. And S2 hat, very close to S2. Okay. So it's, the, it's again the same machinery. The only subtle point here is the only thing that you would like to be more careful of. In the case of point to point, the yardstick was just, was just a loss function. Here, basically, what is our loss function? We have two losses, right? We have the loss of user one and the loss of user two. So how we can make this? as a single loss. And one way that has been done by others is just this comb combined loss, which is a linear combination of loss of user one and user two. And this is the loss that we came up with, a max of L1 and L2. It turns out that in terms of performance, this loss gives better performance than this one, at least in the case 
in the cases we dealt with. Okay. All right, so if we'd like to have a look at some snapshot results here again, we, we, we trained our neural network only at a single SNR equal to 15 dB with a certain rate. And we took our sum rate as K R equal to 2K over N. Here are the performance. I'm gonna describe them top to bottom. The green curve is an all K we joined the coding essentially. And you see that the performance is poor because even without Without noise, all okay, is not an efficient for a math channel. Okay. And then the, the blue curve is the autoencoder for four combined loss. This is the work done by others, combined loss. Okay. And the black curve is the type of sending than the blue curve. The magenta curve, this one is not all okay with time sharing. What do, what do I mean by time sharing? This is the case when each user is exclusively using the channel as if the other is not existing, okay? This is the best performance that I can achieve in terms of single user capacity, single user uh, bit error performance. Of course, it's going to be a lower bound on this, okay? Now, if, we, if I would like to include some, some coding, I'm gonna do an autoencoder 7.4 combined loss, which gives me this brownish, brownish curve right here, definitely it outperformed the encoded system. But with the max loss, I achieve again, around 0 0.5 dB at high SNR, which is not negligible for coded system, right? This is the purplish kind of curve right here. And, and here, this is the learned constellation. The good thing about learning is just you learn what constellation user one is going to use and one constellation user two is going to use. For example, user one with the four four, those the blue, the blue, the blue marks are the mass point location. So he learns how to use basically one, two, maybe four, four signaling input with different, this, those are the probability, the frequency of those signals. It represents the probability of the, the blue curves. User two basically learn how to use so many signals. But uh, an observation, the same thing, just for different, different for the coded system. An observation here, you may, you may say that, but the red has so many mass points, whereas, whereas the blue has only few. It turns out that, the error performance in this case is not very sensitive to the mass point location, nor is the capacity. So you may find other solution that basically give you the same error performance if you will, for the same for the same neural network uh, structure. If you will. Time for time for conclusion. We state state of the art provides computable capacity of point to point optical wireless communication the secrecy capacity of optical wireless wiretap channel, optimal discrete inputs with a finite support achieve so many of those capacities. We have also provided some asymptotic results, hopefully to give you some insight on what the result will be in those asymptotic regime. And we gave a, we gave a, a flavor of some learning based encoding design, although this part is not updated. For those of you who are interested, please look at our Globecom paper this year we have provided some new results big channel based on the auto encoder how to those are all other very interesting problems okay that one needs to look at the poisson channel is still not fully understood and how to design the poisson channel based on auto encoder is also not have not been done neither by us nor by others the mixed RF and optical channel, there are some fundamental results and optimal power intensity allocation there. And we may need to look at the band limited so little by when the band limit, band, band C and capacity perspective. I think that finished my lecture of network and machine learning. Question, you talk about the learning based computation. Yes, learning based computation. You said that uh, it uh, goes without our knowledge uh, through the coding. So, what do you think about that? Thank you. So, so for the learning based design, I don't know when I said, um, I don't recall, I may have said it wrongly, but I don't recall when I said it, it, it learn, it, 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 does a, it does a task without learning. Is that what you said? Oh yeah, yeah, of course. So, so, so basically, so it's an it's, it's an estimation problem, right? 
So it's an estimation problem. We need we need to learn without with sometimes without prior knowledge. So in estimation, this is a well-known problem. So the learning-based design try to do the same thing, try to mimic that problem, that estimation problem, if you will. I don't know if this answered your question or not. And the other question is related to the max law, the combined loss, and you said that basically this in, this might induce, <coughs> sorry, this might induce some extra cost. Uh, could you please clarify what? So, so cost of training. We assume that basically we have so much computation capability, and the training is done offline, and it comes at no cost. Basically, you're gonna run, you're gonna run your training offline, and then you're gonna unplug the machine and borrow that model, and put and uh, and and put it in into exploitation, right? So this is the assumption. We don't include any, we don't incorporate any cost in, of the training here. But I agree with you. The cost of training both you know, is for the combined loss and for the max loss. It may be huge, especially if we try to generalize the map more than to use it. Essentially. There was a, I yeah, please go ahead. No problem. My pleasure. And for this uh, high quality course, for this excellent lecture. And my question is about your, your training layer. So, so you, mm -hmm. you use use DNN for your training layer. And I, I have this general question about how sure you are that this DNN layer will give you, uh, can reconstitute the method. So um, I, I explain myself. So it's about uh, the gap. So you will reconstitute the method through this DNN, this training layer. So, did you estimate the gap between the, the input and the, the reconstituted method before giving it to the second part of your model? This the first part of my question. And the second one is that in deep learning, in deep learning, in, in literature review, I found that in, the, in deep learning, you have uh, you have four classes. Okay. So, so in general, in the general case, is it is this always a good result to be experienced in this way in terms of data? Mm -hmm. So uh, your first question about the channel layer. So what I said is the the, the cha what is the channel? We know that the channel is this the tran this transition probability p y given x. Let's take for example the Gauss solution of mean x and variance sigma square, right? So now now why I'm saying that the channel layer basically can also cap function approximators, right? They are very, very good in approximating function. Actually, there is a there is a fundamental result, mathematical result function can be approximated perfectly using 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 deep neural network. And this is a mathematical framework, it's not a, so the P of Y given X also is a function, is a deterministic function that could be also completely mapped or completely approximated using neural network. That's what that's when 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 my statement comes from. Then then your second question, I hope I answered the first one first. Did I? Certainty that uh, deep uh, that, that basically learning based model are always going to to give us the following the following question I think. It is not proven what it would be the cost of this approximation. Right? So yes Yes, if we assume that we have plenty of computation power, then most of the time learning-based de design provide good solution. But now, if we have some specific application when we require some some real-time requirement, when we have some real-time, uh, I must say, real-time constraint or other different constraints, even for real-time, there are different uh, learning-based design. People are talking now about this reinforcement learning or. So there are, there, this this is a kind of learning network can deal with with this kind of situation, but I'm not sure deep learning network will solve all the problem in a very accurate way. What I what I feel confident learning based design to complement what we we learned from the last seventy years of doing communication and information theory. That's what that's what I can assert. 
thank you, Professor. Uh, it's, uh, I'll just follow in uh, regarding the, the discussion. question. Is, uh, yeah, it's uh, very much of uh, known as a universal approximator. But the fact that you, you, you try to map your input to a Latin space using encoder and then try to de decode it, maybe this still introduce some uh, additional uh, losses in terms of uh, signal. Uh, maybe the yeah autoencoder uh, yeah for are known for they 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 are not the good uh, model for construction. It's not a projection. Other alternative, I, I'm just uh, wondering like uh, normalizing flows. How do you, you try to map your X to a Latin in projection way? It, in the sense that you can reconstruct the input exactly. In other way, there are other approaches like this. M maybe will impact in uh, some ways the, 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 the final uh, noise uh, on, on the input. I don't know if you get my idea. Using so the decoder, maybe you are losing at the beginning because you cannot reconstruct exactly your, uh, your initial signal from the other side, from the VT, the VT user. So I, th I think I, I have a sense of what you want to say, but uh, if, if I'm wrong, if I answer you, if I answer you in the wrong way, please, please stop me and correct me, okay? So at the trans if I understand very well, at the transmitter side, the mapping between this S and M, there is no randomness, right? It's a one-to-one -one mapping. It's a, actually a one-to-one -one mapping. It's a projection, right? When you, when you do the mapping between the message, when you do the mapping, so each message is assigned a certain hard vector S. For example, if I would like to send message one, this is a hot vector basically of the, S is of dimension M, I'm gonna put one on the first component and zeros as well, and the M minus one other component. If I would like to send two, I would like to put one in the second component and zero everywhere else. So this is a one-to-one -one mapping, there is no problem. And then the mapping also from S to X, this is also a one-to-one -one mapping, right? It should be a one-to-one -one mapping because otherwise we, you're, you're ruining your, your encoder. So the mapping from M to S, from S to X, this is a one-to-one, -one, meaning that if you give me X, I should be able, without even before the channel, if you give me the true X, I should be able to tell you what is the message assigned to that X. Now, now when the randomness come from? The randomness come from when you send this X through the channel. This is the time when the randomness starts showing up, and hence why, at the receiver side, you will not get X. You will get basically an X that is corrupted by some, even in the autoencoder sense, you will get X that is corrupted by some noise and, and some channel, channel conditions, basically. I don't know if I answered your question well yeah, or not. Thank you very much. There's a lot of questions, and uh, people are trying. Yeah. But no maybe we go for the last one, uh, as was suggested by Lega or not. All right. Thank you, Mr. Gay, for uh, this uh, lovely uh, presentation. Uh, I have uh, one uh, question. Uh, there are two questions. Uh, the first one is uh, basic. It's about uh, the uh, millimeter wave uh, band and the terahertz uh, band and optical. So, so, the, so the so the frequency, this frequency range, basically the way it works. Sometimes, historically speaking, they are either dedicated. But then, when when people in the frequency band, they start opening those bands, basically. For, let's say, for example, some some kind of bands are only dedicated for to the military, and then then the, the dedicated to, totally to the military. But now, five years ago, it has been open. You, you, everybody can use it, right? Development of microelectronic, of nanotechnology, we can basically stack so many antennas in one single chip, and this is a requirement of the higher frequencies, right? Uh, thank you. Uh, this, uh, the last question is, uh, the millimeter wave is uh, dedicated to five generation, and the uh, wave uh, band is uh, dedicated to, uh, to the six generation. What are the applications of uh, optical uh, optical wave? Is there uh, in a mix uh, to this generation or with, uh, in the mix? Or? So I think I I I am not sure if I'm, I'm, I'm 
I'm not sure I'm following the details of the standard, to be frank with you, communication. Optical is used extensively. Optical wireless communication has been used extensively. In 6G, I think that people, I think they incorporated also Li-Fi, which is sort of visible light communication in, 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 in the indoor. So 6G has Li-Fi, uh, that, that I'm sure of. Okay, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. We have a lot of questions, and uh, I, I will end with uh, my colleague, uh, my colleague Ibrahim. He wants to ask two questions. Yeah, yeah, of course. I know Ibrahim. <laughs> That's right. My pleasure. My pleasure, my friend. trying to highlight right so when people say 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 discrete time so it, so the so the continuous time the continuous time is the setting when we have no constraint on the bandwidth you know why because i can send the pulses that are very very narrow in time and i'm i cannot i cannot send small pulses i have a i have a constraint on the bandwidth Of course, my pleasure, my pleasure. I, I, I thank you very much, and I hope I, I hope you have, I, I was able to convey some messages to you, and I hope to see you next time. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you, bye-bye. Uh, sorry for this uh, delay. We start uh, now uh, coffee break. And after that, uh, at uh, 5 o'clock, we start uh, the technical session. Thank you.